I'm so thrilled to be talking to Sarah Vaughan about her latest book, Reputation. Sarah is, is the name of everyone's lips at the moment because her novel, Anatomy of a Scandal, got turned into a, a hit Netflix series, which was released recently, um, uh, starring Rupert Friend and Michelle Dockery and Sienna Miller, and it's gone bonkers. She wrote a couple of books before Anatomy of a Scandal in the women's fiction genre, and then she started writing psychological thrillers. So there's been Anatomy of a Scandal, Little Disasters, and now Reputation. Let's talk to Sarah Vaughan. Thanks so much for joining us today, Sarah. Oh, it's lovely to be here. Now you're talking to us from London in England, is that correct? Well, I'm, I'm actually just outside Cambridge, so about just 15 miles Cambridge. from London. Yeah. All right, fantastic. So your latest book is Reputation, and it's just hit the shelves, and it gets you in from the first page so for readers who or listeners who haven't got a copy of them for themselves yet tell us what it's about so reputation is about a female labor mp who stands trial for murder when a tabloid journalist with whom she's become entangled is found dead in her home but it's really about the pressures and the difficulties women experience in public life as they navigate their way the series of threats they experience is about revenge porn online trolling and also the threats that teenage girls experience through social media so you're no stranger to the political world because you used to be a political reporter i understand what That's made right. you decide what was the idea for this book how did this the premise form in your head and what made you want to decide to write about these themes so I'd already written a novel called um, Anatomy of a Scandal, which has just become a Netflix series. And that was a bit of a, that was my third novel. I wrote it in 2016. And my first two novels, um, let's just say they didn't bother the bestseller list. They weren't, they weren't very successful, although the second one was, was a bestseller in France. Um, and the third novel, Anatomy, was um, something I wrote out of contract. I didn't know if anybody would want it. Um, and it was an instant international bestseller. It was, an instant, it was a bestseller in Australia um, and it had 10 weeks on the bestseller list over here. And really it enabled me to use um, my experience of being a lobby correspondent for The Guardian, um, having done court cases and um, having been a student at Oxford. And it revolved around a Tory MP, a Conservative MP, who's accused of raping um, political researcher with whom he's had an affair in a lift in the House of Commons. And I kind of thought, okay, I've done that. I've done power. I've done Westminster. I don't want to be pigeonholed. I want to do something different. So my fourth novel was set in a hospital. It was also about judgment and, and gender politics, uh, but, but was more, I suppose, felt a bit more domestic in setting. And then I still, I don't know, I think there are still books to be written about misogyny and power, you know, <laughs> and, and I suppose I thought, do you know what? I, I think I've got one more political novel. In fact, I think I've got another one in me. Uh, in me, and I suppose I thought not not too cynically, but you know, actually, no one is right. No woman that I know is writing quite like I do. No one's been a political correspondent and is mm. using that experience, and a court uh, and has been a court reporter and is using writing courtroom dramas as well in quite the same way. Um, and I kind of thought, well, I've done a rape trial. <laughs> you know what? What? What other high stakes? story could I have and I thought well I could have a murder trial couldn't I I could have an MP who's accused of murder I didn't it didn't effectively come about quite as cynically as that because actually as with so many of my stories I was reading a news report and I had a what if moment you know I was like what's it like if to live to be that female MP so it came from my wanting to write about a female MP but I suppose burbling away in the back of my mind I've been thinking I could do this again you know but I could do it slightly differently and I could learn from anatomy and I could try and write it better. So, so was, actual, what, do you want to, sorry, I was no, going to say, do you ahead. want to know the germ of the idea? You, yes, it, please. Well, yes. I'll cut that out, sorry. Um, <laughs> so I was, so I was going to, I was heading off to something called Noirland, which was in the days when you, you know, well, it's starting to happen again, but in the days when you flew off to festivals and, and crime festivals, I was going off to Belfast for a, for, lit, for a crime festival there. And I think it was May, 2019. It was either May or March, I must check. And I was reading an interview in The Times, um, a big glossy interview with lots of nice photographs um, of a Labour MP over here called Jess Phillips, who is very outspoken, you know, incredibly principled woman. Um, and she experiences a lot of online abuse because of that. And she said um, in this interview that she had nine locks on her front door and a panic alarm by her bed. 
And I just had exactly like your reaction. I just had this sort of, oh my goodness, what must it be like to be that woman, to live? And, and very clear, my, my MP, Emma Webster, is not just Phillips. But I thought, what must it be like to live under that level of threat? You know, and ha- I know that I would my judgment and my thinking would become distorted by that you know I would Mm. catastrophize Mm. I've just written um my fourth novel which is called Little Disasters was about maternal OCD so the way in which postnatal mental health can be distorted you know a woman's kind of effectively gaslights herself Mm. um and I know and I had some experience of that after my second child so I know that I've got a very vivid imagination you know I can perceive threat around a corner on a dark night easily I, I think a lot of women We've all had that experience. We've all walked down a, a road with keys clutched in our hands, you know, yes. kind of being slightly aware of, you know, I must be vigilant. And I thought if you were actually, if you knew that you were experiencing threat from online abuse, from physical threats, from constituents, from, um, you know, perhaps anonymous letters, from anonymous tweets or texts, mm. how might you behave? And it was in the context of, it was the run up to, um, well, Brexit had been agreed, but it was in the run up to it being implemented. There was another very outspoken conservative MP called Anna Subri, and she was experiencing, you know, horrific abuse. You know, her one of her parents was sent a letter, I think, to detailing how she'd be dismembered. <gasps> I think that's right. I mean, you know, and there was a, a Jewish MP called Luciana Berger. She, she was experiencing horrific anti-Semitic abuse. And my own MP was a woman called Heidi Allen, and she had had to have, you know, restraining orders against people. There was somebody in her South Cambridgeshire village, a bit like mine, who was actually went to prison because he put p- pictures on Facebook of her house with scaffolding. Um, and he said, I bought the rope, come and join me on Facebook. I mean, so death threats. I mean, horrific, absolutely oh. horrific. So there were these four instances I knew about of, of, of four different female MPs who were experiencing all these kinds of abuse and it just seemed to me that 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 was a a story that was it would be unique to write a story about a woman in public office who was experiencing that and you can see it more broadly you can see the way in which you know um, the papers attack Meghan Markle or you know Hillary Clinton was depicted or you know you can just see the double the double standards I'm interested in writing about gender politics I guess so you know that Mm. sort of came into it as well. Well, oh my goodness, those stories are incredible. <laughs> they're just they're they're, they're shocking, and uh, no. But obviously, you had no lack of um, real life stories to draw from on yeah. this. Let's just I want to I'm going to come back to reputation because I do want to talk about anatomy of a scandal because that dropped in Australia, you know, only a short time ago. Everyone I know binge watched it and suddenly everyone knows about Anatomy of Scandal and Sarah Vaughan and, you know, um, the incredible story in it. That became up. So your first two books were not were not psychological thrillers. They right. were very different. Right. And then you write. They this. Were, yeah. Tell us what they were. Say, well, like. well, the first two books, I suppose they would be dubbed um, uh, women's fiction for the reading group market. So yeah. I kind of up, up, you know, it's a sort of publishing tag, isn't it? Sort of up market yes. women's fiction. Uh, so the first one was called, uh, which was published in, um, I think they were both probably published in Australia, uh, was called The Art of Baking Blind. Um, and it was about, uh, it, it, it sounds, it, it was about a bake, a, characters around a baking competition, uh, but it was really about the impossibility of perfection. And uh, so there was a, a 1960s cookbook and all these different contestants had to compete to aspire to be like the woman who'd written the 1960s cookbook. And of course there's a backstory and her life wasn't that perfect. So, you know, very, very different. Then I wrote something called The Farm at the Edge of the World, uh, which was really a love letter to North Cornwall, um, where my mum's family are from. Uh, It's a sort of pastoral, but it's a historic time slip with a Second World War story. So very, very different books. Um, Although I would say that Eve of Baking Blind has um, a flick of sexual abuse, there's a character of bulimia, there's there's a bits of darkness, and the farm book has suicide depression. (laughs) You know, it's, it's not surprising that they were packaged as, you know, lighter fiction, but actually they've got mm. some quite dark themes in them. So I kind of was always going to go to the dark side, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think resonated with people so much about Anatomy of a Scandal? Do you mean why it was bought? Because it's why it was bought, so popular. Published. Yeah. So um, 
Well, I wrote it and, and I wrote it from January 2016 to September 2016. And so we sold it a whole year before the Harvey Weinstein allegations broke. Mm-hmm. But it's about consent. So it's about, a, as I said, a, a, you know, a male MP who's accused of raping someone he's had an affair with. It was very important. It was someone he'd had an, a consensual relationship with in a lift in the House of Commons. Um, and I followed a barrister in a, in a rape trial. So, that, so I, it was very important to me that I got all the consent right. Um, but I wrote it before I'd heard of Me Too, you know, before that mm. became a movement. But I think that probably it's something that an awful lot of women, certainly women in, a lot of women in publishing, you know, a women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, um, a lot of, so, so it resonated with them when they were buying the book. Mm. And I think that it's probably something that an awful lot of women not necessarily rape, but we've all experienced something, or the vast majority of us have experienced something along that broad Me Too continuum, whether it's, you know, being catcalled at one or flashed at one end to, to being raped at another. Mm. And I hadn't realised, I mean, obviously you shouldn't write books as therapy, but I do put mm. quite a lot of myself in my novels. And I hadn't realised really until I finished writing it that I was exercising a sexual assault that I'd experienced in my early 20s mm. um, from an entitled an entitled man uh and um and so I I suppose it resonated because of that Mm. I think it resonated because of that probably um I think that so when it came out it came out three months after the Harvey Weinstein allegation so we were starting to have conversations about Mm. sexual assault so it was it was published into a climate in which people were more alert to it and more aware of it I would also say politically it was partly inspired by our now prime minister Boris Johnson. So I, as a political correspondent on The Guardian, I had interviewed him uh, at the tail end of November 2004, so a long time ago now, um, about the fact he'd lied about an affair. And it wasn't the fact he'd had an affair that was story that was newsworthy, it was the fact he'd lied about it. And it was the first time I'd come across um, a public figure who had, had seemed to have perhaps felt no compunction about lying. Um, mm. And I think that when it was published, that was quite a sort of shocking thing to think about a politician in a way it's been amazing post-Brexit I think and now that he's come into power how we now accept that Mm. public figures might lie or or, or certainly (laughs) our prime minister has you know but it's still I suppose that might have been a quite an audacious thing to think Mm. um but it's and then of course the, the series dropped on April the 15th um in the wake of over here we've had this party gate um you know, oh, yes. uh, scandal that's been rum, rum, rummaging on, uh, rumbling on even, um, mm-hmm. and the issue of trust and the issue mm. of whether people are being honest about things has really come to the forefront because um, over here, you know, we, we've had these lockdowns where, uh, you know, a lot of people were, I know you have as well in, in, mm. in, in, in Australia, but, you know, the the vast majority of people were, were quite strict about, you know, my kids were homeschooling, my husband's a doctor, so he was, you know, very, very strict about us adhering to the rules. You know, I was very, very strict about and very, very cautious. Mm. And we've discovered over here that, you know, there was a party atmosphere in, 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 at the heart of government. Um, and so trust has become a real issue over here. So I think that the series dropped, you know, mm. I think it dropped like two days after the police find the prime minister for being at a party. I mean, it could not, I joke that the marketing, you know, it was nice for the government to help or the prime minister to help with the marketing plan, but you know, <laughs> it could not have been, it could not really have come at a better time. So I think that, you know, you're starting to see over here quite a lot of, you know, news stories will have anatomy of a scandal as a headline. Mm. And I wasn't as conscious of it being a phrase that was sort of, you know, in the lexicon quite to the extent that, mm. it, that it has been. So I and think it- that's probably those elements that's why it's successful it also uh it doesn't hurt to have Rupert Friend Sienna Miller and Michelle Dockery <laughs> <laughs> I'm starring in a series <laughs> but actually more broadly I suppose you're saying why mm. did it why did, was it was mm. it successful when it came out and it you know it has been my most successful for book and um, I think I also I hadn't realized when I was writing it that that strong female leads certainly in in Hollywood are a thing you know but I think Mm. that I do write all my books I'm very interested in the interiority of a character so um you know I had with Anatomy I had well Kate in the book Kate is is the protagonist and Sophie's slightly less important in the show Sophie's at least as important she is the lead Sienna's the lead but you know there I, I was depicting their interior worlds 
mm. in quite some detail. Sienna Miller referred to it as being her Bible, you know, because obviously in the script, you don't mm. see all of that. So she would keep going mm. back to the book and reading that to try and understand Sophie, uh, which is really flattering and a brilliant thing to, to learn. So I think that and I think that that has appealed to people as well. You know, some won't, you know, you'll find some reviews on Amazon saying, oh gosh, don't want another chapter of her thoughts. But I think that, I hope I'm quite good at exploring the interior lives and the psychology of women. And I think that that's appealed as well. Mm -mm. When did you, do you, do you recall when you got the phone call or the email or the whatever that said Netflix want to turn your book into a TV series with these incredible actors? Do you remember when you got that news? Yeah, so I was in, on holiday. It was August 2019. So I, <laughs> it's quite a, it's quite a long process. So I'd actually sold um, I sold the TV rights in February 2018. I was uh, so the book came out in January 2018. I went to Spain to do a uh, press trip for for the Spanish edition, um, and I had various different. Um, teams who were interested in buying it I was a really lucky position so I was having conference calls in Spain with the different the, the, the various different teams and then I knew that I had to um that they were going to put in their bids like in an auction and my family had actually flown out to meet me I'd done I'd done the Madrid bit on my own and then I went to Barcelona to do some more press and my family flew out to have a couple of days in Barcelona and I was going round the new camp stadium at Barcelona with my son, who then would have been, I don't know, what was this, 2018? He's just turned 14, so he would have been uh, 10. 10. And, um, and I was meant to be focusing on, you know, the, the stadium, but I was so just looking at my emails on my phone. <laughs> and I saw that, that um, you know, the final offer and, 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 and the people I wanted to go, the go with and I had been intending to buy my son a pencil because I'm you know I, I'm, I don't this was all quite new to me you know and it was enough of a treat that my kids were going around the stadium uh, so I was going to buy my son a pencil but by the time we got to the shop I actually bought him a Barcelona <laughs> hoodie because <laughs> I was in a sufficiently good mood <laughs> so that, that's when we I was like whispering to my husband he was like you're not concentrating on the tour and I was like no I've just had the final offer <gasps> oh so I my bought my God. son a, a Barcelona hoodie so that but then so that was February 2018 but then you know these things take a and I knew that this dream team behind Big Little Lies so David E. Kelly, Bruno Patrick mm. made up stories mm. is now based in Sydney uh, and um, Liza Chase and the Three Dot Productions I knew that they were all buying it I'd gone with them but you don't hear anything for a long time um, and then I knew they were going to pitch it and um, I knew they were going to pitch it and we were actually on holiday so it makes it sound like we're always on holiday we have we haven't actually <laughs> holidayed because, because of COVID we, this was our last holiday August 2019 end of August 2019 and we were actually um, on holiday again <laughs> in Italy um, and um, again it was me surreptitiously looking at my phone because I knew that they were going out that week at the time and it was about there was a beautiful sunset on this sort of medieval town in Italy and I said to my husband, they've, um, Netflix are buying it. You know, I knew they were pitching to Netflix and I knew that's where I wanted it to go. Uh, but you, you know, you don't know if they're going to be successful. And I just had this thing say, it's going to happen. And then you still aren't allowed to tell anybody until they announce it. Mm -hmm. So they didn't actually announce it till the May 2020, by which stage I'd had dinner with the director and one of the executive producers. I'd worked on some, started working on some scripts um and it was meant to start filming in June 2020 uh but because of COVID it didn't start till the November but that meant that I had we had that whole period from the sort of March through to the November of me giving notes on scripts and the scripts you know wow really good. yeah what an incredible so it's a experience. long gestation period yeah it's yes. a long gestation period but I still couldn't tell anybody <laughs> that Rupert Friend was you know I was getting in the summer of 2020 I was getting messages from authors who knew or one author who knew a casting director and they'd seen the sheets going out saying Sienna Miller Rupert Friend and it still hadn't been announced so I was still I don't know what you mean I can't possibly comment on that you know until the <laughs> September tw September 2020 they didn't announce that Rupert Friend was going to be in so I had to keep this or, or Sienna or, or, or Michelle Dockery yeah oh yeah so the exciting it, part is Rupert Friend let me assure you <laughs> but um, well, I, I think to... it was perfectly cast I have to say there's a certain 
I, I know an awful lot of um, uh, female authors my age or writers my age, and that was the thing. The, the um, I'm part of a sort of writing uh, group. Uh, well, we don't really. Um, on Twitter really that we all came together our, our novels were written at a similar time our first novels came out at a similar time and the woman in charge of the, the Twitter feeds that day Tammy Cohen the writer um she just kept putting in cat letter in cat locks Rupert Friend how I mentioned Rupert Friend <laughs> and there was this sort of frenzy of you know female writers who were just terribly overexcited about that yeah oh, yes lovely. It, absolutely <laughs> lovely absolutely lovely okay so you became a journalist when did you think I want to write novels because it's a very very different thing it's a very different process it's a very different experience very different level of commitment so when did you start thinking that or did you always well, want to I write think, novels well I think life kind of makes you behave in different ways or you know actually it was life circumstances that enabled me to write novels um I think I'd always I did when I was a little girl I wrote stories and I won a creative writing competition when I was 10. <laughs> Devon Young Writer of the Year, uh, which is Devon's the area I was brought up in and I got a, in those days, 1983, it was a lot of money, I got £75 in cash with which I bought a radio and a typewriter, this was pre-computers obviously, I couldn't have bought that, <laughs> £50 in book vouchers and my mum made me buy um, a leather bound set of Jane Austen's along with all the Judy Blooms that I wanted to buy. <laughs> But then I was quite an academic child and I, I can really remember sort of feeling like my imagination had sort of left me when I was about 14, you know, because you because you're suddenly you're having to do exams and your head's filling up. So I think that sort of childlike imagination that I was, you know, I was writing stories when I was 9, 10, 11, just, you know, dissipated. But I did go off um, to university to read English um and I got into journalism very very quickly at, at, at uni and I knew that I wanted to I first of all I thought I wanted to be a flautist but that I quickly realized that actually what? I, wanted to that was, <laughs> I don't know I wanted I played the flute um, but okay. I quickly realized that actually what I was good at was um was writing and I thought actually I could do journalism I can remember going to the careers at, um office at, at Oxford and looking at publishing looking at journalism and it said publishing you need to be rich and you need to have contacts and I was neither I don't know why I then thought um I think the idea being that in publishing the pay is you know very very bad oh, you know maybe you read with. something so you satirical <laughs> yeah no no I think that you have and to get into it you had to do internships and, and things mm -hmm. it's, it's a real it is an issue um uh but actually in journalism you also have to do unpaid work experience and I also had no contacts in journalism at all but what I did have was I was features editor of Charwell which was the university paper and a lot of editors on Fleet Street had worked on Charwell it's a kind of like a, a Willy Wonka golden ticket and so when I went for, for work experience at the Times and the Observer and the Guardian they, they would see oh she works on Charwell she's you know and I'd done other local journalism as well but I, I couldn't get in on a local level so I went and did, if it, I did lots of work experience and I ended up doing three months on the Times and I got, I got into journalism that way. But, and, and it didn't, to be honest, sorry, to answer your question, uh, it didn't occur to me that I could write a novel really. I remember when Zadie Smith, who I think is a couple of years younger than me, got a book deal straight out of Cambridge. I remember being quite appalled because, or not appalled, but jealous, frankly, mm -hmm. because I had, um, I'd done an English degree where you didn't have to read anything after 1832. Uh, mm -hmm. that's the Oxford English degree I think I did a I did a paper I did a paper on the novel so I did Wolf as my most modern novelist <laughs> Virginia <laughs> Wolf um, and Henry James and George Eliot so I mean I was hardly looking at contemporary fiction um, and so uh, yeah so just but I did, did know I could journalism um, and I didn't attempt to write novels while I was a journalist. I think I was so busy writing news that my brain mm. was just programmed to write like that. And I didn't really have the headspace um, or the confidence maybe to, to find a voice and to find something I wanted to write about until um, I actually took voluntary redundancy from The Guardian because I had, a, I had a pregnancy complication that meant I couldn't walk very well for three years after my second child. Mm. So I took the money I freelanced from home. I was hopeless at it. I wasn't very good at all. I was <laughs> writing news reports, Mother and Baby magazine and, you know, hating it. Um, and but I was doing and I was sort of being a mum. Mm. And I suppose my it was the first time that I'd sort of 
not stop because it's busy with young children. But, you know, I, I'd, I'd taken the pace down a bit, I suppose. And I was doing lots of creative things with my kids. I was doing lots of baking with my kids, mm. painting and whatever. And I suppose, you know, it's it was lovely, but it's quite boring on one level being at home with little children. And so my I had the time. And I had the headspace in a way to think about other stories. And I, and for me, it was that I noticed that, you know, I was going and picking my daughter up from the school gate and going home and playing with my toddler son. And I was noticing that cake thing, sales were a thing at the school gate, but they were, I, you know, the first time I gave cakes, to, my daughter had decorated them. So they looked disgusting because they were, you know, she was five <laughs> and I was four. And I didn't realize that that actually these were a form of competitiveness and that all these women who'd had high powered city jobs were making these immaculate frosted cupcakes with sprinkles and you know sparkles on the top and that clearly these cakes were not just about you know raising money for the paddling pool at school or the swimming pool at school or whatever they were there there was some deeper level in there and I started thinking why do people bake and at the same time the Great British Bake Off had suddenly yes. became a water cooler movement thing here sorry this is a very long answer no You're no gonna it's have great to that right down <laughs> and um uh I think it was I think it was the autumn of 2012 and uh uh yeah the woman who won it they have a little on the on the final episode they um they talk a bit about their backstory and they interview their um you know members of their family and they show them at home the next day after she won it the daily mail uh, revealed that her husband was in prison for fraud and she'd said I just want to do something for myself the winner had said I just wanted to do something for myself and the next day you know it transpired her husband was in prison for fraud and I thought wow we never know what's going on in people's lives you know mm. that is the perfect illustration of somebody who's being shown with her blue aga you know making her sparkly cupcakes looking as if life's serene and she's con- she conjured up this image of domestic perfection mm. and yet her husband's in prison for fraud <laughs> you know I mean that the the, the dis- disparity is stark isn't it so I started mm. thinking about what about if lots of people went into a baking competition and they had really difficult backstories and why are they baking you know what what's what's what, what's the hunger they're trying to feed by with these ridiculous cakes yeah sorry long story no no that's so that, great that's, that's, that's how... set you down the path of, of being a novelist so now right. you've got reputation so in terms of the um plot and what you decided was going to happen to your story did you yeah. you, you already kind of had your premise and you probably started the with Emma you know the, your, your protagonist yeah. And your inciting incident, which gets you in from, you know, the first page. What um, what did you know about the rest of the story as you started writing? Or are you one of these people that you discover what happens as you as you write? Because no, because so before I... we started recording, you 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 hid your post-it notes. And so <laughs> I'm assuming that maybe you use your post-it notes as a bit of a you know timeline or a plot. Baffled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not somebody, I did an event at the weekend with Sophie Hanna, who writes a 30,000 word synopsis before she starts. (gasps) And she actually calls it a knocky jar. Yeah, I know. Because, and she was explaining, and I was like, but that's chapter three, you've kind of, you actually, she actually details, it's kind of like a rough, a very rough, small first draft, I guess. Yeah, it's not a synopsis. (laughs) It's not a synopsis. I was like, my God, I can't write a 30,000 word synopsis. Um, and I'm one of those people that can't, I just, I keep trying. I'm, I'm not very technological. So I've just been trying to download Scrivener and work through it. And I just can't get my head around it again. So I have got a post-it board here for the new <laughs> one, uh, which is, um, uh, so, but I do use, I, I increasingly um, use post-its as a sort of scaffolding or, you know, index cards and, and move them around. And I won't know all the plot, but for instance, since anatomy, I guess I've, I mean, I'd never heard of a three act structure or a, you know, or a save the cat or anything like that until I wrote anatomy. Mm-hmm. So the first two, I don't know how I wrote this book. Really. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but the third, the third one I did actually, I did for my first one. It was interesting listening to, to P- Patrick Gale talking about yeah. this for the first one. I did have a sort of grid with chapters across the top and characters down the side. 
Like, mm. All my books, I seem to write from multiple points of view. So even that first yes. book, I wrote from five different points of view. I didn't know that that was quite an ambitious thing to do for your first novel, but, you know, I just did it. Um, and so I did exactly what Patrick had said, you know, so that I knew I, I got a sense of the balance of the story as I was going through it. Mm. But now what I do is I know what the ending is going to be, although often there'll be a, like a final little twist that will come to me at about 80 percent of the way through. That mm. I'll get in, which is what happened here but I'll know roughly what the ending is. With this some of the anatomy and with Little Disasters, I know the outcome of the Little Disasters is kind of a police inquiry um, with anatomy and reputation as a court case. So I know what the, um, the outcome of the court case is going to be and what's going to happen after that. Um, and I know, yeah, what the inciting incident is going to be. And I know, for instance, when I've just started writing, I know very much the, the arc, I suppose. I know what the midpoint, I mean, with anatomy, there's a there's a twist at the midpoint and it's it I have no idea how it is literally on page 200 of a 400 pa word book the twist comes there and I think that must be some sort of instinctive yes you know I, I you know I spent three years reading books um as a degree um I read a lot you know I just must have instinctively picked up okay I'm gonna have my twist here but it came about through cutting and you know knowing mm -hmm. at that point I had to come there now I'm more experienced I know okay, I'm going to probably have something quite dramatic that's going to happen at my midpoint, you know, yes. there's going to be a twist or there's going to be, you're going to have to sort of rethink something at the midpoint. So I'm sort of plotting my new book. I haven't written very much of it, but I know what's going to happen, that the moment of realisation for my character is going to come at the midpoint and mm. things are going to change after that. I think it's quite interesting to think of it almost like, not four acts, but like a second act that's split in the middle you know mm, mm. so uh is so, that yeah. incredible that it was on page 200 of a 400 page it's book i mean that's astounding 300, or it's two, 203 out of 400 sure. or something. i mean it's just freakish um and and i think that's why it's quite effective you know but yes. i obviously must have instinctively done that so i yeah so i i sort of know the sort of scaffolding but i've got an awful lot of blanks which i'm anxious mm. about um and I sort of try to make decisions about, you know, is it going to be first person, third person? Is it going to yeah. be present tense, past tense? I'm trying to do the current one. I'm doing it in the past tense, which I, I tend to kind of, uh, reputation, some of it's in the past and some of it's in the present. What I often do is put the past sections in the past and the present sections in the, the contemporary sections in the present. Um, yeah, but a lot of that is quite instinctive, I think. But certainly yes. the, the structuring, the structure is something that, that in the past I've really struggled with. I've, I've kind of, it's not been sufficiently pasty and I've, I've tried, certainly I think in my second novel. And um, it's something I'm really trying to work on. And I think that reputation is pastier because I learned a lot from the scripts of anatomy. So I was right. make, giving notes on those while I was writing reputation. And I was seeing that actually a TV series has a lot more shorter scenes and moves on at a, a, a more of a pace um so I've tried to sort of learn from that um yeah and I've also tried to very consciously you know, because I was trying to heap lots of jeopardy on Emma my my protagonist I was very consciously sort of you know ending chapters on cliffhangers or with, mm. with an ink I was thinking with each chapter has you know does this justify being here is there you know is there an element of threat in this here or is it if it's an introspective slower chapter is it relevant does it add to the character does it tell us something we don't know um so I, I suppose that and I think that comes you know I've written five books now so I suppose that just comes with with practice doesn't it and experience mm. and, and so reading. with the characters and with your characterization or you getting to know your characters because as you say um uh, when you were talking about anatomy and about that interior monologue uh that um, people like Sienna Miller drew on and, you yep. know, that the reader can see because it's on the page. With the characters in this book, and you do write in multiple points of view, you, there's your protagonist, Emma, there's a daughter, Flora, there's other characters, Mike, whoever, that you write from their point of view. Um, you obviously need to know your character intimately in order to write believably from their point of view. Mm. So when does that happen? When do you get to know your character? Are you the sort of person who has a fully formed character before you start that first draft and have like a dossier on their backstory or that sort of thing? Or again, is it instinctive and you kind of know, oh, well, Flora would say this or Flora would react like that? So I kind of make some character notes and I'm not, as I said, I'm not very techie, but, you know, I'll have like word documents where I'll say, you know, uh, so Emma, I kind of, I worked out a backstory for her that 
isn't very apparent, you know, but it kind of, I needed it to sort of bed her down. Mm. Uh, so, you know, she was a single child with, with, you know, a trade unionist father. I worked out how she came into, pol- how she was interested in politics. I worked out, I wanted to create spoilers, you know, Don't- how her sort of <laughs> initial enthusiasm might have been diminished by something that happened to her, um, you know, and how that might have then impacted. And then I was really interested, I'm really interested in writing about you know, I'm I'm now 49, but you know, she's 44. I'm interested in writing in women about women in their 40s who kind mm. of perhaps are experiencing that their, you know, initial sort of power from their perhaps their that they're unaware of it from their their youth and their vigor and their sexuality, you know, is perhaps diminished, but they're kind of wanting to forge a different career for themselves. And I think mm. 40 is often a a a crisis point like that I should have said actually when I was talking about me writing novels it was at my 40th birthday that I stood up I drank too much for Prosecco and somebody had said what are you going to do now and I said I'm going to write a novel and get it published within a year oh my god <laughs> really I, that's a good that's a good story I'll have to tell you that yeah yeah so I so I just tell you that and we'll have to yeah absolutely right? so basically I'd, I'd given up I took redundancy from the Guardian after my second child was born I was 36. I tried to freelance. I wrote these pieces that I um, was hopeless at, you know, but but I was paid for, but I just didn't enjoy being, I felt like I was sort of prostituting myself in print because you'd send off these ideas and then people would reject them. And, you know, that's a bit extreme to say prostituting myself, but I just <laughs> felt like it wasn't what I wanted to do. Mm. Uh, but obviously I had to earn money. Um, and um and, and I'd always had this niggle, I'd always had this sense of I want to write a book. And I suddenly felt that I had things to say about motherhood and the difficulty of motherhood, which had been a shock to me after being quite successful about everything. You know, I got straight A's, I've gone to Oxford, I've got a Guardian job at 24, I'd trained with the Press Association before that. You know, everything had gone quite swimmingly. Mm. Suddenly I was in lots of pain having a second child and finding it quite hard being at home with with two small children and I stood up anyway the week that my youngest started school I turned 40 and somebody said to me you know what are you going to do and and I've been working on on this book you know I'd only written 20,000 words but I'd secretly been doing it my husband knew about it and I said I'm going to write a novel and get it published within a year (laughs) which was completely naive. I wasn't on social media. I'd never done a creative writing course. I didn't know about agents. I had no (laughs) idea how any of this worked. And my husband actually said, look, I I sort of said to him, look, could you, could I've still got a bit of redundancy, but could you support me financially for a year? You know, I hadn't, didn't buy any new clothes for six years. Um, You know, I could be quite frugal, but you know, this will be difficult, but could you do this? Because I think this is a really good idea. And he said, and he knows nothing about writing either um well I think you're meant to get an agent aren't you I think you need to know you get you need to get an agent if you're going to do this because you can't just write something and it not be um it 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 not happen and so I emailed um I looked in the back of a book of someone I enjoyed the book and I saw in her acknowledgement who her agent was (laughs) and I emailed this agent who happened to be Leslie Kramer the agent behind the girl on the train uh which wasn't published then but she was sort of working on that and I emailed her and I said I'm a I'm a journalist, I'm writing a novel on this, I've written 30,000 words, I hadn't written 25, Um, (laughs) I know exactly where I'm going, I can meet deadlines, do you want to see this book, sort of thing, which is completely not how you're meant to do it, you're meant to write your whole book and, you know, polish it, it be exquisite, and by the time she, I was picked off the slush pile by a reader, by the time she got back to me, I'd written, I was actually looking at, uh, courses to do PGCEs to become an English teacher you know I was literally looking thinking what am I going to do how am I going to earn some money do you know I don't want to write freelance journalism I'd rather be a teacher so I was looking at and you have to pay over here you know you have to pay for it and I was like how can I find the money to to do that um and the phone rang and uh, she'd by that stage I'd written 66,000 words of a first draft and she effectively gave me a sort of creative writing MA you know I kind of (laughs) just sent I mean it's just not how you're meant to do it at all because it was very you know rough first draft that's incredible um but she could see uh she could see I think the potential of these characters yes. that these characters really spoke well she didn't even read it she had a reader who picked it off the slush pile who said you know she can write so her first words to me you can really write and that was the most amazing validation yeah. but she didn't sign me until uh the September when we'd gone through about four or five drafts 
And I said, well, you, you know, do you want to be my agent or something? You know, it was ridiculous. <laughs> but I was thinking, you know, perhaps she doesn't want to publish me, you know. And I think we sold it two weeks later. Oh, my or God. Six days later or something. In That's a fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So That's that was fantastic. my publishing story. I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> oh, my God. But yes. But the good thing about standing up at the, at the party and saying, I'm going to write a novel in a year, was that then I had an element of accountability. Mm. So all these mums at the school gate who knew I'd been a journalist, and, and that I wrote, didn't doubt that I could do it, which was lovely. So one in particular said to me, how many words have you done today? And I said, well, I've done my thousand words or I've done my 1500 words. And she would say, what's happening now? And, you know, and so there was an accountability and I would have been quite shamed faced if I hadn't <laughs> written it. Yeah. Speaking of um, how many words in a day, how many words do you aim for in a day generally while you are in that first draft? Oh, I think it's really difficult to generalise. So anatomy, I wrote really fast in nine months. Um, uh, reputation took me two years but we had these different lockdowns and that first lockdown uh, which was for us was March the 20th right through to mid-July 2020 god it's been going on for ages hasn't it mm -hmm. um, I had to ho effectively homeschool my youngest who was then 12 but you know over here you couldn't see friends you couldn't do sport you know he didn't have any zoom lessons zoom mm. was sort of you know not, not uh so it was just links that they were sent. And I realised that if I didn't teach him, he would be out of the school system. Mm. So um, so I sort of made that decision and I wrote in the evenings, but not very well because it was such a sort of intensely anxious time. Yes, and yes. I think that I, I wasn't, I couldn't be anxious about my characters. I could, but when I had to be anxious about real people in my life, <laughs> you know, so, so that's why that took longer. But to answer your questions, I mean, ideally... I'm not writing, for, I'm, I'm starting off a novel at the moment and I'm agonising slightly about it because I'm finding my way in. Um, so I don't know, I haven't set a word limit on myself. I just have to turn up. But when I'm into it, yes, I'd have to do at least a thousand. Um, but, you know, on a good day, I could do 2,000 or the most I think I've ever written is sort of 2,500 and then I'll find the next day it'll be 1,500. I won't be able to sustain that. I'm I'm very jealous of people who will put on Twitter, oh, I've done 5,000 words today. Or I've, <laughs> you know, even I've done 10,000 words today. And I'm like, how on That's earth do you write anything? There's <laughs> any quality if you do that. But I, I've decided it's that thing about um, comparison is the en enemy of joy. Is that is that the, the, the line? Yes. I think that the books I write are quite, take quite a lot of research. Um, and I think they're quite textured and I do really think about I'm not saying other people don't do this but if if I was writing two books a year or three books a year I would not be able to agonize about the quality of the, each sentence and the rhythm of each sentence mm. which is something that I try to make it be mm. quite elegantly mm. written as well um, and so I think that's probably why it takes me Mm. longer you asked me another question <laughs> and I went off on a tangent about my it was actually birthday. about the characterizations oh that's right yeah. that's right so I would write a um I would have word documents where I'll say characters and for instance the one I've just started writing my um protagonist I've gone into a lot more detail than I have for other characters because I think they will emerge as I go along mm. but there are four kind of key players and I've kind of fleshed them out quite a lot and I'm sort of reading along as far as I go with Emma yeah I'd worked out her backstory um I knew so I knew she had this ex-husband David um and I knew roughly what their marriage would have been like and I knew she had, there was this other woman his second wife Caroline so I'd mm. sort of worked out her backstory and, and, and you know so all I've written about I actually, with Caroline, I wrote from her, I thought, okay, okay I'm going to do a document. I'm just going to write from her point of view about what's her rationale for, she actually was a friend of Emma's and then she has an affair with Emma's husband and marries him. So I thought, okay, I, what's her rationale for this? And I started writing in the first person, although she's in third person, I started writing a document in the first person of Caroline. Oh. And then I used, actually, you turn that into a third person and use some of that yes you know, as a chapter the chapter where she's playing the piano actually a lot of my original notes then just sort of um came into that and flora i mean i was bullied throughout school and um, and i when i started writing this my daughter was 14 <laughs> so although she's not in any way flora and i had to change lots of things to make sure she didn't appear like flora and she's not really into social media i interviewed lots of I interviewed some of her friends. I interviewed mm. um, the daughters of my friends. And I said to them things like, if you were going to bully somebody on social media, how would you do it? 
which was fascinating because I didn't know about Snapchat or, you know, stories on, or I didn't know that the lengths that somebody, and, and they were really, they really knew their stuff, these girls, you know, they, would, they weren't going to do it themselves, but they could give me anecdotes of things they'd observed other people experiencing, you know, mm. or, you know, it, it's a world I don't know anything about. I do know that if I had been bullied if in the 80s they'd had social media, late 80s they'd had social media, I don't think I'd be here. I think oh, be, look, I, I, you know? I agree. I don't know how. Yeah, it's, it's, it's and astounding. I, yeah. And I think we will actually look back, serious point, I think we will look back in 10 years, 20 years time, and we will think, how on earth did we allow our children to mm. be exposed to so much of that? There's been, yesterday there was a coroner's report from another death of a 14-year-old girl oh, who killed gosh. herself after seeing someone on Instagram. I mean, mm. I think we will look back and we will think, how do we expose our kids to that? You know, the, mm. the unregulated nature of it. And also, you know, on Twitter, the abuse on Twitter. I mean, I, I've seen a tiny bit of it, not, not you know, just sort of feedback on um, Anatomy of a Scandal. You know, the, every most people I know have been have loved it and mm. features have been but there have been some some snipey um broadsheet reviews and criticism and people love to be me <laughs> so oh. people you know on twitter people have been hot some people have been a small minority but of course you focus on that don't you um of course and, and let's just, let's face it they're wrong <laughs> but anyway <laughs> yeah but, but it's hard to, it's hard it's knowing that somebody thinks that and actually it was it's really interesting i then got the viewing figures for the first three days was 40 million viewing hours and then the first full week was 75 million and one of the producers said to me look at the viewing figures and actually I thought you know this is 75 million people in the first week have watched a story that came from a book yeah. I wrote yeah the well the I think the numbers speak for itself for it's yeah. you know for themselves uh, for anatomy it, literally everyone I know has watched it your latest book reputation everyone go get a copy it's absolutely fantastic what we uh, what we always wrap up with is uh, what are your top three tips to others who want to be in a position where you under, you are one day, you know, they want to have their books published. What are your top three tips to them who are still trying to get there? Um, okay, so the first thing, which is not very original, is um, to read. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, I think... I think you can't underestimate how important that is and, and read. I mean, I was really lucky. I, I didn't do a creative writing degree, but I did a three year degree in which I read lots of different literature. And, you know, arguably um, you could say, well, doing a whole paper on Shakespeare isn't going to help you. But actually, you know, it, I'm prefacing my, each book at the moment with a, with a Shakespearean quote and the themes that come up, you know, about power and revenge, uh, you know, is present there, you know, characters with fatal flaws, you know, people overarching themselves um, and falling back to ground. You know, those sort of dramatic arcs are present in those. I'm not saying go and read Shakespeare, but I'm saying anything you read is going to be helpful and read mm -hmm. across genres. I would say don't just read um, in your in the genre you want to write in. Mm -hmm. because good writing is good writing and you will learn a lot about character from reading how you know perhaps more literary people write it I would I, I always cite um Hilary Mantel's Bring Up the Bodies which is the second of her Cromwell novels which might seem like a really heavyweight tone but I think I have learned more from um uh reading her sort of it's closed third person consciousness so it's you're in the head of Cromwell but it's written from the third person but you yes. never feel you leave his you know you leave his head and I I just think you know dip into her prose if I'm a bit stuck I'll read a bit of from somebody who I really you know I'll read an opening chapter from some from a book that I admire or I'll see how a, how a hook works mm -hmm. and it sort of inspires me again so obviously read um we didn't write, talk about writing routines at all did we I, I know because I've been so busy uh, vamping <laughs> no tell us about your writing routine but just that you aim for around a thousand a day you kind of mentioned that but around yeah. a thousand a day and I and I try and treat it like um you know I I really envy people who kind of get up and they write you know their thousand words before they have breakfast or whatever I've got children of 14 and 17 now but I suppose they were then four and seven when I started writing um and you know it's important they as teens they actually I feel they need me almost as much as they did when they were little in some ways you know and I think COVID has also meant that obviously it's easier in lots of ways they're more independent but you know we're we're a close family so they you know I'm I'm not going to sort of you know go off and write first thing in the morning and not say hello to them or anything sure. so my day starts with you know 
unloading the dishwasher, putting the first load on, making breakfast, uh, walking the dog, uh, which is which is good because we've had about five years. And, you know, I think my the days that I don't walk her, you know, if, I, if a child does it instead, I have a really bad backache by the end of the day. So oh. I think and I also feel really um, sort of scratchy. You know, if I don't get out and have a walk, then I, I'm not writing well and I have to mm. get out at lunchtime. I think it's it's something about walking or running, just being outside, getting fresh air. Um, so I'd actually say that's a second tip. I'd say yes. look after, I'm not very good at it, but look after your physical health because you're going to have to put your bum on a chair and you're going to have to write mm. this. And I would say get out. Get, there's something apparently about being out within two hours of being up or, you know, an hour of being up. The, the light's meant to be very good for you. I would say get out if you can first thing, even when we had lockdowns and we couldn't go out very much, you know, if you can get, if I went out and just walk around the block, mm. it, it's something about that that sort of kickstarts um, thinking. And I would say, um, I'm not very good at this, but I think Graham Greene talked about authors having to have a, a shard of ice in their hearts, <laughs> which I think meant sort of, you know, be prepared to be ruthless about, you know, you do cherry pick people's lives a little bit. Mm. But I would say it's more about trying to be ruthless about I work you know I have friends who say oh but you know your day's your day you can come for a dog walk then or whatever but no this is this is a job I don't get paid unless I deliver yeah I'm quite busy uh it's now not just um writing is it it's doing podcasts it's you know this evening I'm doing a zoom event uh you know it can writing can stretch into all of the day but try and be strict about yeah. even if you only have and I don't work at week. I, I try not to. Well, I do work at weekends if I'm on deadline. Mm. I went through a whole spate in lockdown of working every Saturday because I wasn't working very well in the week because of the kids. Um, so, but, you know, on a normal week, I try not to work at weekends just because I've got my kids. Um, but I do write better if I, if I manage to get a little bit in and manage to fit, you know, an hour in mm. on a Saturday and Sunday. I write better on the Monday because the story is being continual. But mm. try and make sure that you carve out, that you're strict about, you know, I would never, you know, mornings particularly or until my kids get in at half past three, I try and be really, really focused. I would never book anything up then. That's when mm. I write. Be ruthless with yeah. your time. Mm. yeah because it is it's a it's a job it's a yeah a business sounds very cynical but you know it's I, I am I, I'm not I'm writing to connect I'm writing because it keeps me sane I'm writing because the best thing that the absolute best thing is when I have you know I've had emails or messages quite a few after anatomy came out from women saying thank you for articulating what I experienced mm. or you know I didn't realize that I needed to see Olivia give evidence in court to realize that my that I wasn't being ridiculous to feel like I did or you wow. know to 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 make my so even people who've given evidence in court cases you know you actually captured it and thank you and I've had you know also my fourth book um which is about maternal OCD I've had quite a few emails from people saying I didn't realize that you know with people I've known I didn't know there was a there was terminology for what I experienced and I've now mm. gone on the website and shown my partner and you know I'm now going to get some help I mean that is the best possible feeling to feel that something you've written has resonated with people and has made them cry or has made them think or has you know challenged their not challenged their behavior but you know has has touched them mm. so yeah so so that so I write to do that but I also you know, I have a mortgage, <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, I have to earn money and it's, it's not a hobby and you need to not treat it like a hobby. You need to take it seriously. And I feel we have one more, right? Okay. Bonus so I've tip. thought of a bonus tip. Uh, so I would, and this is possibly once you start writing, if you, if you, you know, you're lucky and you've been, you've been published. So I would say, don't write cynically for a, for a certain market, because I think the books that, speak to people are ones that are written with quite a lot of passion I can remember there's a chapter in Anatomy of a Scandal where um uh the, the Libertines my drinking club are smashing up a restaurant and the um author very successful best-selling author Lisa Get uh, Jewel um uh messaged me and she said I bet you wrote that really fast it reads as if you wrote it really fast and I did I, I was really angry when I wrote it and it reads as if it's passionate and it's got an energy to the scene because I'm excited about it and I'm excited about this bit of the book so don't be cynical and try to write for a market but at the same time 
particularly I suppose when you've had a few books published, be very aware of the market and perhaps even be aware of your brand. You know, so if I wrote a book now about aliens, I mean, I'd have to write it under a pseudonym and I've got no desire to write about aliens, but I'd have to write it under a pseudonym. So it makes sense that I'm now writing another political, broadly termed a political thriller, because that's effectively my USP at the moment. So, mm. but, but, you know, I don't set out to think I'm going to write a book like Anatomy of Scandal or, you know, you've got to write the book that speaks to you. Brilliant. Great advice. Okay, hope that helps. Uh, I think you're doing something right. So, you know, congratulations on your latest book, Reputation. And thank you so much for talking to us today. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. It's been lovely.